Köszönöm szépen a Bien, igazgató asszony. Én vegyesen fogom az angolt és a magyart használni, mert a programot azt angolul hirdettük meg, és az előadásokat is úgy kértük, tekintettel arra, hogy rendes jó Covid módjára ez egy hibrid esemény, és valójában a legtöbb nézőt azt online várjuk, ahogy az eddigiekben. So I will switch to English, uh, but I also wanted to welcome you again in our home environment. Uh, this is uh, the Culture Institute is uh, one of the crown jewels of uh, our embassy. Uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier uh, during the day at IMAC and at uh, the University of uh, Leuven uh, is uh, a large bilateral embassy and it has uh, all sorts of uh, different functions from the military attaches office to the uh, classic consular uh, political work. Uh, this is a place where uh, Hungarian uh, culture is shown to the wide public as we know uh, uh, in uh, Brussels. And uh, we always thought, and my predecessor thought, that uh, Hungarian science is very much part of that Hungarian culture. Um, one of my early predecessors, uh, Laszlo Tócsányi, who later became our ambassador in Paris and also uh, a professor on his own right in law, uh, and actually had a very important role in uh, building ties with the Francophone uh, uh, world uh, in Hungary, University of Szeged, and also UCL here, uh, University of um, established what was called the uh, Belgian Hungarian Professors Club or Belgian Hungarian Professors uh, Circle. Uh, rather the translation. And that included uh, really, really amazing people, including uh, names like uh, Professor Lanfalusi, who was uh, the father of the Euro, uh, died a few years ago. Uh, Professor Fruling, also uh, not amongst us, unfortunately, who was the uh, permanent uh, president of the uh, French speaking uh, medical academy here in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and uh, uh, these were people, uh, those who are still alive are in their 80s uh, or early 90s. Uh, obviously, uh, when I first assumed uh, this ambassador position in 2010, uh, they were not in their active phase. And my wife, uh, having a PhD, uh, had the, uh, the, the ambition to recreate something in this field. And then when she and, and two other uh, younger researchers uh, well, that was actually that most of them were at the uh, at Caldwell actually uh, started to look, and it turned out that there are over 100 PhDs uh, in their 30, late 30s, early 40s uh, in uh, Belgium who are hailing from Hungary. Uh, hence, the idea of the uh, Science Club, uh, which was established uh, back in 2013, I think, and the first uh, uh, presenter or the first uh, uh, guest was. Uh, uh, no less than the president of the Hungarian Academy of Science, uh, then Mr. Palinkash, Professor Palinkash, uh, who uh, came. And in the years since, uh, during my absence, but also uh, while I returned, we had really, really amazing uh, uh, science clubs, uh, uh, learning uh, everything from uh, urban highways to uh, historical research, uh, the first science club that we had uh, during the season was focusing on the connection between uh, uh, Hungary and Belgium. Uh, there's a bridge called Buda uh, in Brussels and there's also uh, a bus line that's called Buda and that's in memory of the uh, 16th, 17th century connections uh, uh, that are uh, related uh, to the uh, siege of Buda in 1686. Uh, where there was also uh, Flemish participation. So uh, they focus on various things. Uh, one of the most successful uh, science clubs that we had was uh, Professor Merkeli, uh, the rector of uh, the Semmelweis University. Of course, it was pandemic-related uh, topic a few months ago. Uh, we had over 5,000 uh, uh, people watching it uh, on uh, Facebook. Even if we are not expecting as big of an audience uh, for today, I think it's very important. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to have you all here, uh, a cream of the, the crop, if I may say, of uh, 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 various uh, fields uh, uh, in the framework of the official and uh, uh, research network. 
And that research network uh, currently comprises 11 research centers, uh, seven research institutes, and around 150 additional supported uh, research teams operating at universities and other public institutions conducting both basic and applied research. Their research is exploring the most varied uh, disciplines of mathematics and natural sciences, life sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. The network was named after Laurent Wittwersch, the preeminent Hungarian researcher and scientist who, through his diverse scientific work and leadership, exemplifies the interconnectedness of the humanities and natural sciences of research and innovation. As a graduate of a university that's called Lohan Wittwersch, of course, uh, he's very dear to my heart, although that was law school and uh, some that don't call that real science. The network uh, builds on uh, the rich legacy of Wittwersch in articulating the various character of collective wells of knowledge accumulated in the research network over more than a century. The aim is to contribute to Hungary's long-term success, and I think that's the uh, most important goal that uh, researchers uh, can have. The mission of uh, the network is to safeguard academic freedom and to operate Hungary's publicly funded research network more efficiently with continuous emphasis on performance, transparency, and excellence. As part of its mission, it supports uh, the efforts to translate the results of basic research into solutions that contribute to the resolution of the domestic and global social and environmental challenges. The network promotes collaboration between domestic and international members of research. Furthermore, it supports Hungary's endeavor to be at the forefront of research and development in Europe and the world. And I was very happy that today we had a chance to look at our receiving states, uh, two top institutions, uh, the Leuven Catholic University, uh, which is uh, one of the few European universities who are uh, within the top 50 of the world's best. Uh, and also IMAC, uh, with its uh, focus on nanotechnology, is one of the leading uh, uh, research institutes in their uh, field. And I'm very happy that uh, we could have that uh, experience uh, together. The ambassador rarely takes a full day out uh, uh, from the schedule to be there. I really wanted to make sure that uh, everything goes well uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we could not be certain until the last moment uh, that uh, these programs uh, can actually go ahead. So I'm very happy and relaxed that uh, uh, we are here in the evening and uh, everything went well. Please uh, let me uh, uh, welcome uh, here uh, Dr. Bela Pitz, uh, the director of the Institute of Technical Physics and Material Science of the Center for Energy Research at the Tersh-Loran Research Network. Uh, and after the introduction of the Institute, uh, my uh, director Pitz, uh, Pitz, uh, sorry, uh, we will hear five scientific presentations in order to discover the varied disciplines of mathematics and natural sciences. So I welcome here uh, Dr. Chaba Balaji. Uh, the title of his presentation is Noble Bone Like Layered Ceramics, and I heard it once, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, as well as the others, Dr. Peter Patrick. Uh, the title of his presentation is Development of Nanostructures and Non Destructive Characterization Tools. Dr. Robert Horvath. Uh, with the uh, title Single Cell Biosensing and Manipulation on Nanostructured Optical Waveguides, Dr. Janos Borg, Energy Harvesting, and Dr. Peter Furiesch, Integrated MEMS Tactile Sensors in Minimal Invasive Surgery. With fur without further ado, let me give the floor to uh, Mr. Bale. Yes, dear colleagues, first of all, I have to express uh, my thanks for the whole organization. We had a very useful day, and uh, it was a perfect organization uh, carried out by the embassy. We did work, uh, thank you. <laughs> we did work, um, and it was very useful uh, um, discussions, both at the uh, Lumen Catholic University and then at, at IMEC. And this possibility gives the bonus of the day for us. So you can see here three logos. And uh, about 35 years ago, I graduated at Lohan Dutrush University as physicist. And two years ago, I became a member of the 
uh, newly set up uh, Laurent Bentoche Research Network. Uh, you can see our, the logo of our Energy Research Center, and finally, this is the logo of our institute from which all of the, the today uh, speakers uh, uh, come. So, uh, these numbers you, you have heard, and uh, the Center for Energy Research is composed from three institutions. One is the Atomic Energy Research Institute, which runs uh, a, a small nuclear reactor, a research reactor, and also serves as a, as a safety base for the Paksh uh, nuclear plant. They have another one, Institute for Energy and Environmental Safety, does a lot of uh, experiments in neutron spectroscopy and the chemical research, and uh, our one is the third institution, is about 110 people working in, in this institute with 75, 80 researchers. I also put here the Wigner Research Center for Physics because they are uh, situated on the same campus that, as we are in Chilebirds on the Buddha Hills. Uh, they are composed from two institutions, the particle and nuclear physics, they are working on on subjects which are common with, with the CERN in Geneva and Institute for Solid State Physics and Optics they work with lasers and other, other solid state uh, physics uh, uh, problems and new materials we cooperate with them a lot and then instead of uh, speaking on my, on my uh, uh, institution uh, you will you will hear the, you will listen to, to the talk of my colleagues and I decided that I will speak on uh, my own research field in a way which is microscopy, electron microscopy, in a way that uh, probably uh, you can understand why electron microscopy is important for us. Because these uh, features you can recognize, and even 100 years ago, the optical microscopy gave a lot of information for the society. When people could uh, could recognize uh, bacteria because the bacteria is about one micrometer large. If you want to compare uh, the diameter of, I don't have too many, but a piece of hair, the diameter is 150 micrometers, so that is a little bit smaller. But the resolution limit for, for uh, optical microscopy is practically that one. It also contributed a lot for metal research and things like that, but already we learned that there are smaller objects, both in the biology and in the material science, and we would like to, to study them, and therefore we need other tools. Actually, concerning the, the electron microscopy, there is a special type of chiral microscopy, uh, which resulted in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, the Creo microscopy, and later on, actually at the beginning of uh, last year when the pandemic started, an American group determined these kind of images, uh, which represent uh, the COVID-19 virus, and provided the necessary information for all of the developers on the spikes and the other parts of the, of the COVID-19 virus. We, in the Institute, we have a certain history because we are not two years old. Before, we, 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 we did work for the Academy of Sciences, but two years ago, the Parliament decided that the scientific body and the research institutes were separated. And that was the, the moment when this research, new research network was, uh, was formed. So it was already in the 60s when these three colleagues, uh, Arpa Bonna, Peter Bonna, and uh, Jordan Nozzi started not the microscopy but started in situ microscopy, which means that inside the transmission electron microscope they not only imaged a specimen but they started to evaporate material and anneal and take and took movies. And here the scale is already 0.2 micrometer and you can see fine features. Actually, these are the images taken showing that the indium particles are growing and some of them uh, are observed uh, in coalescence and they could, uh, they could actually evaporate uh, two different materials and study 
uh, different material science problems with a better resolution than, than in the optical microscope. So we hunt, and uh, this research society uh, hunted a lot the resolution. But what does it mean? We have two intensity spots in our image. And then the question is, if we can see them in two points, or we can, we can see a broader intensity uh, profile. And this is the criteria here on this one. So when we are closer than, than these two, then we, we can see them, see them as a single spot. And the very simple equation above there says that the, the, we can see, we can distinguish two intensity spots when the distance is uh, not smaller than the half of the wavelength. High, half of the wavelengths for the, for the blue light is 200 nanometers. So even in special light microscopes, you can't go below 200 uh, nanometers. And of course, uh, scientists knew that, for example, electrons, which can be focused relatively well, uh, have smaller wavelengths. This is actually a, a funny and very interesting story, because electrons are particles, but they also have wave behavior. And this is the, the Brody equation, which, uh, which brings uh, uh, the wavelengths of the electrons. And here you can see uh, the higher voltage we accelerate the electrons, the shorter is the wavelength. And actually, those two images, uh, both of them I took in a transmission electron microscope, and both of them are images of single crystalline diamond with very small spacings. It's, uh, the largest spacing between the atomic rows is about uh, 0 0.2 nanometer, two angstroms. And there is a big difference. This one is taken in our new microscope, which we purchased three years ago. And because we have the, the resolution, uh, a very good resolution, then it turns that above. There are two carbon atoms uh, behind one spot. And we needed a better microscope and uh, new principles, actually, to, to, to resolve them, because we call them numbers, and the very short distance between, between them is uh, 89 picometers, so below one angstrom. Uh, why? Uh, we used to say that these kind of glasses are, are relatively good, so they focus into one, one focal point the, the, the image. But unfortunately, in these uh, electron microscopes, in order to focus the electrons, we, we need electromagnetic lenses, practically coils, and they are not perfect, very far from the perfect. They are good for the, for the rays which are close to the optical axis, but when there is a, a pass which is relatively far from the optical axis, then the focus is somewhere else, and it's not in the same focal point. And then, the, the image of one point will be a disk. So the image will be not so uh, satisfying. And actually, 20 years ago, the same happened with the, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So there was a two and a half meter large mirror, and it was launched in the sky, and they started to take the, the image of the, of the stars, and, uh, space and the above image was taken because they had this kind of spherical aberration. And later on it was fixed on a second mission and uh, that image was taken. So uh, in, in the case we can uh, adjust the spherical aberration and we can make uh, perfect lenses, uh, then we can get better, far better images. And this is on the right, you can see our a microscope which is getting old already three years old, and it's the first uh, aberration corrected uh, microscope uh, in Hungary. Actually, this is uh, this column is composed from different lenses, and here we have uh, this size of a part in which we have uh, not spherical lenses, but also we have hexagonal lenses and things like that, and we can really not only we can set it to zero, but we can adjust the, the spherical operation. Here you can see the, uh, the technical limitations we had to, 
to, to provide for the room. It's a big anti-vibration table be below the microscope, three meter deep. And then look at that. In 30 minutes, we, we have to keep the temperature with uh, the precision of 0 0.1 degrees C. It's difficult. And also the strain magnetic field. But then we can take images like this. Okay, atomic images of small crystals are not so surprising, but uh, on this image actually we don't care in those ones which uh, are big for us. We take care of, uh, sorry, we take care of this and this, because these are platinum small crystals, but those ones are single platinum atoms which we can identify on the surface of, uh, of carbon. And uh, I hope that this will work. If you, yeah, it's moving. If you observe on the right upper uh, corner, there is a small crystal of platinum, and under the heat of the, of the electron beam, it turns a little bit, it rotates, and then it turns into a perfect crystallographic uh, uh, position. Ah, sorry, yeah. And uh, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, this is a, an image which actually uh, we took on an older microscope of us and we, we, here we demonstrated the elemental mapping at the nanometer scale uh, based on electron energy loss images. Actually, in those days we had a, a car industry project, a European project, Wismale, uh, a uh, big Germany uh, player in car industry, 150,000 in, in employees. And here we could determine the, the chromium nitride and boron nitride uh, uh, B functional uh, coating. And now with the new microscope, there is a there is a crystal which is uh, has this composition, strontium type titanate. Here you can see the position of titanium and strontium, and at the atomic level we can distinguish the titanium and the uh, and strontium. Actually, my my research back to 20 years was focused for the for the gallium nitride and related materials, which is the material of the blue lasers. So we studied in the 90s uh, a lot of defects, basic defects in the gallium nitride. Then uh, I think in 2001, Osram published that they prepared uh, the blue, the European blue laser diode but they didn't publish that the lifetime was one minute. So then we had a European project and uh, with French parties we, we prepared uh, this kind of structure in which the dislocations were bad. And then the dislocation density in this uh, very nice material was decreased and the uh, lifetime was increased first to 100 hours instead of one minute and then further and further. Then we came to to, to the power electronics, so in this gallium nitride power electronics, uh, instead of the former milliwatts, now people are, are measuring the, the power in watts, and the power density is very, very high, which means that uh, there is a problem uh, we face, that, and that's the self-heating. In order to decrease the self-heating of the device, which is, uh, which is not advantageous, we need a uh, material which has very high thermal conductivity. The best one, or probably the best one, is the diamond. So then we studied nitride transistors which were grown on two single crystalline diamond. And then we also tried that we had a transistor structure and uh, there was a diamond layer on the top deposited. And we had some success and uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I studied two-dimensional um, semiconductors, including two-dimensional nitrides. So, so we, we tried to, to synthesize indium nitride, aluminum nitride, and gallium nitride in a very thin layer between graphene and silicon carbide. So first, the uh, epitaxial graphene was formed on the silicon carbide, and then in a, in a CVD uh, chemical vapor deposition process, indium was intercalated here, and we managed to, to cover 90% of the surface with a B layer, and the remaining part was a little bit thicker. And then we, we studied this B layer structure, we determined the structure, 
and also could measure IV characteristics. And from the IV characteristics, we, we learned the most important property of this semiconductor, the band gap, this two electron volt, instead of the 0 0.7, which is characteristic for the, for the bulk materials. So the, the basic properties of the two-dimensional semiconductor is, uh, are completely uh, different from the bulk ones. And microscopy contributes to, to, to this research, uh, research, I believe. And with these words, I, I call my, my colleague Peter to, to, to speak on these results. Thank you very much. So, my name is Peter Fugesh, and I would like first of all thanks for the organization all the day and uh, this evening also. So, it's my honor to be here and introduce our results and talk about our research. Uh, first of all, I will give a small box to spread it. And you can see some small chips inside. I will talk about that. What, what kind of chips are there? So, today I will talk about integrated MAPS tactile sensors in minimal invasive surgery. Uh, there are several interesting words, I think, in the title. Because I don't know who knows, for example, about the MAPS. So, first of all, I will introduce it. What is a MAPS? Pressure measurement. But today, we will talk about the touch sensing, the tactile sensing which is a quite problematic sensing, but I will talk about that. And what is the actuality uh, that we talk about uh, surgery robotics? I think two weeks ago a new surgery robot was installed in the Semmelweis University. I think that this is the, the, yes, this is the first day of, uh, of the robot at the Technical University, this is a surgery robot. A surgery robot of the uh, Intuitive Corporation. This is a Da Vinci XI robot solution. How we can, how, how not we, but the, how the doctor used the surgery robotics. Surgery robotics means that this is a minimal invasive surgery. Minimal invasive surgery means that uh, the doctors using laparoscope are using the laparoscopes for the surgery and due to the laparoscope surgery it has several advantages. They could use for general surgery, gynecology, urology and other uh, so problems to solve. Uh, in the world there are more than 1,000 and 1,500 uh, surgery robots. Uh, in Europe, more than 200, and in Hungary, there are there is one. So I think it's a, a very very good uh, for for the patient because the patient has several advantages: the smaller course and less blood, no need the uh, blood donation. Uh, the recovery could be much more faster than uh, normal surgery after a normal surgery. So that's why not only the, the robotic surgery, but the minimal invasive surgery using, for example, manual laparoscope could be uh, much more advantageous, advantageous for, for the patient. But what about the surgeon? Yeah, the surgeon has, for example, disadvantages. Why? Because they lost the visual feedback. If we use a surgery robot, it means that we could see the tissues by an endoscopic camera. The doctors cannot touch, for example, the tissue, so he lost or she lost the tissue shape, temperature, pressure, the texture, the elongation, the vibration. So it means that uh, the restricted image area due to the endoscope 
and lack, lack of tactile feedback. So this could be a disadvantage for the doctor. And how we can solve that? I will talk about that. We can solve it by using an artificial tactile receptor. But how we can use, how we can fabricate an artificial tactile receptor? Uh, it's not so easy because the tactile sensing, this is the sen uh, sensing of uh, the human skin, it's uh, quite complicated. We have six different uh, sensors. The Meissner corpuscule for for skin stretch, the Pachinian corpuscule for non-localized vibration, the Ruffini is for directional skin stretch, the Merkel disc for local skin curvature, but there is no force sensor. The problem is that we are, we are quite good for fabrication, development of fabrication force sensor, so we try to fabricate biomimetic force de de detection. Several other researchers try to mimic, of course, the tactile sensing and using these tactile sensors inside laparoscope, uh, laparoscopes, but they are tactile sensor matrix inside the laparoscope tweezers, which gives some pressure distribution map and not a force, a bacterial force sensing. So our goal was to make tissue recognition or to solve the tissue recognition by a tooltip, 3D tactile sensor, and force feedback inside the clamp of the endoscopic surgeon tool. So this was our, uh, our goal. And this is uh, the development line in nutshell what we started. So we started uh, with uh, finite element modeling, of course, the, all the structure to get some information about the size, the membrane size, and what would be to use, and uh, what structure should be used for the fabrication. For the fabrication, of course, we use the micro-machining technology in our laboratory, is a silico wafer, and in the silicon wafer, you can see such small devices. In the box which you spread it, there were uh, several uh, different uh, force sensors. The smallest one, uh, what the size of the smallest one is one by one millimeter. And after that, of course, we integrated into a flexible electronics for real electronics. There is a communication electronics between the, the force sensor and the uh, Surgery robot because uh, it has to be quite secure, so that's why and signal processing. And after that, we try to find a new solution how to give the doctor information to the doctor. Okay, uh, just some details about that. The minimal size of the uh, chips, one by one millimeter, because we have to measure one to. 20 newton between the grip, and we have to measure 10 to uh, 1000 millinewton for tactile sensing. It's quite different, so we had to fabricate quite different sides of chips for a more sensitive and a less sensitive but more robust. The sensing principle is the piezo resistive sensing principle. Uh, it's, I think, quite several. We, we use the, in several sensors. Uh, we have to measure only four voltages or in the Wiston bridge arrangement. So it's a quite, quite easy to measure, I think, the voltages. Here are the fabricated sensor. We use the 3D micro-machining technology using SOI, silicon isolator, wafer, implanted resistors, deep reactive eye matching for vertical side walls, and uh, fabricating a very, very thin membrane which will deform uh, due to the, the applied force. We use anode bonding for the backside, for mechanical stability and parallel metal contacts. <coughs> we use flexible electronics for the integration. This is a flexible uh, PCB containing the sensors and the uh, readout electronics, the ADCs, so the analog digital converters. And we fabricated on other electronics which is capable to communicate uh, with the robot. Because the robot has the same security uh, solution like the cars. So in the cars they use the campus communication for the secure communication. So that's why the robotics 
uh, the developers of the robots are using the same communication security. So we have to make a communication board uh, with initialization, signal conditioning, and calibration, and other solution. If we have these electronics, we had the time to start with the first test, first push of the sensor. So we had the signals, and for the signals, we could calculate the vectorial force, which means that the value of the force and the direction of the force. This is a simple analytical solution, and after calibration, we could use it in a laparoscope uh, and surgery robot. So I think this is a very, very interesting, interesting question. I could ask, for example, how could we give back the tactile information for the for the surgeon? So, if any idea, I'm so open because we talked about that. For example, uh, show some number from one to ten. Okay, but the doctor said that there are several numbers on the screen, so they would not like to see other numbers. Okay, then colors. Oh, colors. Then, uh, then, then, from I don't know red to 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 green. But uh, I think the nice solution was uh, was uh, demonstrated by our our partner, Polish partner, who is developing the robot. They fabricated a, a tactile controller and a haptic controller, and it means that we can measure the force and the force give some information to your robot. And the robot makes, makes changing in the movement of the haptic controller. So it means that if somebody is trying to control the robot, and for example, the tip of the tactile sensor touching some, some surface, uh, tight surface, then the controller is stopped or getting harder to move. So this is a, a haptic feedback for the surgeon. Not numbers, not colors, but a feeling in the arm and in the, in the hand. So OK, this was the demonstration of the applicability of four force sensor for, uh, for surgery robotics. And uh, now we are trying to use this for for tissue recognition. So this is quite actual. I think uh, this measurement finished in the last week. So there are the tissues, and the tissues has different uh, uh, stiffness parameters. So if we could measure the forces versus the, the deformation, we could uh, determine the, the stiffness parameter, for example, the, the flexible modulus. So first of all, they try to use these uh, force sensors for measurement uh, tissue parameters. Uh, these are artificial tissues, polymers. And after that, we try to measure stomach, not uh, human, first of all, but uh, core stomach. So the measurement is uh, based on the movement of the laparoscope. So we can move the laparoscope in the direction of the tissue, and we could measure the force parameters. So this is, and from this force parameter, we could we could calculate the Young modules. So this is our uh, development, and how we can integrate force sensor or tactile sensor uh, for surgery robotics. And what is the future? So the future telling medical application of these MEMS devices, I think, uh, could be highlighted here. So we are fabricating, we are developing smart system. Smart system means that it has energy supply, sensing, signal, and data processing, and communication, and actuation integrated together. For example, this is a smart catheter of the Philips, uh, developed uh, in a project working together, but for example, this is a smart prostatic which has brain-machine interfacing, so there is a, a single interface between the uh, 
neural system and the machine and it has sensors for example to give tactile information to the brain other possibility is to use implantable autonomous devices for example with energy harvesting sensing and actuation solutions this is for example an accelerator implanted on a heart to measure the movement of the heart and of course the possibility to require the human sensing uh, functions if we have some problems for example that so we could use to substitute the imaging I think it's quite actual no professor Roshka is working on that uh, using cochlear implants or for example interfacing and stimulation and implantable electrodes in the central nervous system so I think it could be the possibility for using these MEMS devices microelectromedical systems in the medical application and I feel and feel I believe that uh, medical is the new automotive so these devices will apply for the medicals so I would like to thank for the collaboration for our partners of all the financial support from the uh, Hungarian Fund, the National Research Innovation and uh, Development Fund, and the European Foundation, of course, and thank you for your attention. The physical system consisting of uh, one million particles. And uh, let's say that only one particle behaves a little bit differently than the other particles. Then a good physicist would immediately neglect the single particle and try to create a theory based on the remaining particles. And even the, the large physicist uh, Max Born, the German Nobel Prize winner physicist, uh, said that this, this is the largest gift of mankind but we can ne neglect things, so basically physics is the art of neglection. So we can uh, investigate a very complex system like the, the sun and the earth, and the earth is moving around the sun. And we can neglect uh, that the, the earth consists of hills and lakes and just represent the earth with a single point mass and, and, uh, and the sun with a single point mass. Simplify strongly the system and make a theory out of this. And uh, this way of thinking was working quite well. And it, it is really working excellently for uh, physical systems. But uh, this way of thinking is, is, uh, is challenged by biology. So I think uh, the boundary between physics and, bio bound and uh, biology is really that, that how we think about systems. So for the biological systems, we, we say this is far too complicated, we don't really have a nice theory, and this, this basically means that this way of thinking, of simplification, is, is not working anymore. And uh, for example, just to give you a, a, a biological example, that if you have a, a solid tumor consisting of uh, 10,000 cells, and you are employing a treatment, and you can kill all of the cells, and only one, one cell will remain alive, but if the conditions are good, this one cell can divide very fastly and can form a new tumor. So this is very clear that in, bi in biology, this is not, it is not possible to neglect even a single cell. So this is why we should, we should create uh, technologies which can investigate biological events at the single cell level. And this is the only way forward. And uh, the main focus of our laboratory is the adhesion research. So adhesion is a quite fundamental phenomenon in life. So basically, almost all cells should adhere, either to the extracellular matrix or to another cell. And uh, it is very important in the spreading of cancer, in the action of immune cells, so that the cells should uh, adhere on the, on the blood vessels, should adhere to the to cells and, and go through on the endothelial layer and form another tumor. Also in the action of immune cells, the immune cells should, should penetrate into the tissue, adhere them and kill, kill for example, bacteria. So this is a, a very important phenomenon in biomedical devices. 
In some devices, we don't want the bacterial cells adhere on a surface, but in some applications, we would like that some kind of cells, for example, bone cells. Uh, Chaba will talk about that uh, the bone cells can stick very strongly to the, to the medical implants. And but how to measure this adhesion, and especially the force of these adhesions. So this is uh, quite challenging, especially at the single cell level, because one should measure force in the nanonewton, piconewton range, with very high precision. And with traditional techniques, the throughput is extremely low. So for example, with, with uh, AFM, one can measure 5, 10 adhesion events per day because it's, uh, it takes uh, so long time to perform the one, one experiment. And uh, we would like to speed this up significantly, and our aim is not only speed this up and increase the throughput of adhesion measurements, but uh, to measure the adhesion events in, in real time. And uh, the very first technique we are using is the robotized uh, fluidic force microscopy, so this, this is based on a conventional AFM tip, but compared to the conventional AFM uh, cantilever, it has a microfluidic or nanofluidic channel inside, and if we employ this, uh, this cantilever with an opening at the end, and this, uh, the size of this opening is only a couple of microns, and we stick on the top of the cell, and this pressure control system employs a vacuum, then basically the system sucks in the top of the cell and one can lift up the cell from the surface. And during this process, uh, this cantilever is bending and from the bending one can, can calculate uh, quite precisely the adhesion force. And this system has a much larger throughput because then you don't have to glue each cell on the cantilever and after remove with, with some chemical etching because you just ap apply a positive pressure and you can go to the next cell and measure the next uh, adhesion even. So with this technology we can go up to, I would say, 100 cells per, per day in terms of adhesion measurements. And also this system can be used as a printer. So if we are using this, uh, this uh, tip-shaped uh, cantilevers with these small opening holes, we can either print some patterns, so this is the smallest printer in the world, actually, this is only one micrometer, the size of a bacteria, or, e or we can even inject some material into living cells or suck out the material of, uh, of the living cells. It is, it is quite uh, surprising that you can even remove 50% of the, of the cell mass, and the cell will be still alive after this process. So right now we are working uh, mainly on the injection, so we are injecting nanoparticles, vesicles, plasmids to transfect the cells, to modify this, uh, its genetic composition. So we are working on these type of topics for, for, as for medical research. And the next technique we are developing together with a Hungarian startup company, the Cell Sorter, is the computer controlled micropipette. And this, uh, this technology is aiming at uh, the cell sorting on a, with a relatively high throughput based on computer vision. So basically the robot moves a glass capillary above the cell, which is selected by uh, its shape or whatever the user is uh, programming into the system. And after, again, just like in the fluidic force microscopy, it, uh, the robot applies a negative pressure and the micropipette uh, sucks the cell inside uh, this glass capillary, so it's, it has a diameter of all, only 70 micrometers. And after that, we can inject the cell out into a PCR tube and investigate its genetic composition or protein composition quite, quite easily. The, the throughput of this system is, is much better than, than the throughput of the fluidic force microscopy. So at least uh, 10 times better, 10 times faster. And very recently, we could even prove that one can measure precisely the adhesion force based on this technology. So we calibrated the, the force uh, using microbeads. So 
we made computer simulations to get the force for the microbeads and we also employed the fluidic force microscopy on the microbeads and, and measured the sticking force uh, quite precisely and, and calibrated the, the, for the, the vacuum values to force values in the, in the microfiber measurements. So this is the next uh, technology we are using every, every day now. And uh, the, the first technology, the third technology is, is, has even more throughput. So with this system we can measure even 10,000 cells per day. And, and the nice thing is that, that we can measure these cells simultaneously and even we can, we can follow the, the adhesion <coughs> even in real time, which is not possible with the micropipette or the fluidic force microscopy because you are measuring the force at a single point and you don't know the force before, before that or, or after that, it's impossible to measure. And uh, this technology is based on optical waveguides. The, the optical waveguide is, is, a, is a thin layer with a high refractive index. And basically in this free layer, you can trap the light. So the light uh, can propagate in this thin, thin, thin layer in, by total internal reflections. And if we employ a grating structure, we can couple the light into this thin layer. And during propagation, the, the light uh, or the, this propagating wave guiding mode creates a, a so-called evanescent wave near the interface. And this, uh, this evanescent wave penetrates roughly 100, 200 uh, nanometers into the cells and senses very precisely the, the refractive index in this contact zone. So this technology is excellent to measure adhesion events because once a cell is landing on the surface, it touches the surface only at a single point because it's a, it's a sphere. But when it starts to attach and adhere, more and more material is entering into this contact zone and increasing the refractive index here. So if we can follow the refractive index in real time, we can follow the adhesion event with very high precision. So this, this technology is even sensitive to, to nanometer scale movements in, in the cell membrane. And basically we could reach with this technique single cell resolution. So these are the images of single cells and, and the kinetic curves of the adhesion events. So this was the time point when, when the cells were added, landed on the surface. And you can see that some of them adhered quite strongly, but some of them are weakly. But we can characterize all of these events in, in real time. Uh, but uh, the problem is that, that we, we are measuring refractive index change. So we don't know the force values. And then we came up with an idea that let's combine these two techniques. And uh, we built a system where we are performing the measurement on the optical waveguide sensor chip, measure the kinetic curves of the adhesion events, and after that, we remove the optical waveguide and put it underneath the fluidic force microscopy and measure the force distance curves by this uh, mechanical technique on exactly the same cells. So this is a, an example of uh, a large cell, so you can see that the optical signal is quite, uh, quite strong. And this is the force distance curve when this large cell was removed from the surface. This is, this is the curve for a small cell. And basically using this technique, we could calibrate the optical biosensor. And right now, so it, we could prove that, that there is a very nice linear trend between the optical signal and the actual single cell adhesion force. And now we can we can uh, calculate that how much is the adhesion force at this time point, this time point, so everywhere on this curve. And we are employing this technique in different uh, topics. And only just to show you some examples, so we are, we are investigating the, the sugar coat of cancer cells and, uh, and discover the regulatory mechanism for these sugar coats, the, the thickness of the sugar coat of uh, cancer cells is, is quite thick compared to the normal cells. 
and we could prove that, uh, that it can control the adhesion strength. So it can even increase or decrease, in, decrease the adhesion strength by changing the, the thickness of the sugar pool. And we are also working on cell cycle progression, so how the cells adhere, how quickly, how strongly, when they are dividing. And also we are working in collaboration with a group uh, from the Eötvös University on novel type of dr drugs. So these uh, new molecules are isolated from, uh, from plants or, or from fungi, and some of them are quite effective for cancer cells. And we are investigating these things in, in real time that how these new drug, drug candidates uh, affect the behavior of cancer cells. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention and, and I give, it, give the stage to, to Chaba for the next presentation. Excellency. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank to uh, Hungarian embassies to organizing uh, this uh, one today program uh, at uh, Catholic University of and, and um, also IMEC. So we learned a lot. I am also glad to be uh, here with this Hungarian delegation of the uh, Research Network. And uh, it is a short talk. I would like to give you a uh, material science point of view uh, to making uh, uh, body implants. So the title of the talk is uh, Surface Activated Ceramic for Bones. Um, my name is Chaba Balaji. And uh, I would like to this, uh, begin with this uh, highlight from American Ceramic Society Bulletin that uh, offers and asks for better bodies with uh, biomaterials. Of course, is a uh, increasing demand uh, for a lot of uh, type of uh, biomaterials and uh, a lot of implants, as you can see here. So we have all a wonderful uh, organism, a wonderful body, I would say. So we know that uh, our body incorporates uh, structural materials, so uh, solid structures uh, that uh, can give uh, support uh, to the mechanical strengths, but also incorporates a lot of function. And uh, you can see probably here an overview. Uh, it was presented also before uh, by my colleagues, Beta uh, Robert. So um, this is a very intimate content, uh, contact between the uh, soft tissue and hard tissue. And uh, the interface matters. So um, the surgical doctors, if we have fortunate uh, accident or uh, we have some intervention, medical intervention, uh, we, we, we can have uh, problems with skin, we are going to dentist, uh, the dentist uh, using different prosthetics, implants, uh, we can have uh, eye problems, um, jaw, spine, uh, implants. Uh, in this talk, I would concentrate more to bone, um, the bone structure, the bone grafts, and ceramics, uh, what uh, we want and aim to develop here. But of course, we are we cannot develop uh, ourselves. I'm a material scientist. We are um, cooperating with uh, all kinds of science, with uh, chemists, with uh, physicists, with. Uh, medical doctors even, who are trying and giving feedback, are giving feedback uh, if it's working or not, or there, is, there are happening some infections, unfortunate infections, and again, uh, this implant should be made again uh, with better materials, better and better. 
So we are concentrating to bone tissue engineering. Uh, we are doing uh, materials from uh, uh, metallic implants, from uh, polymeric implants, ceramic implants. Uh, we are incorporating some bioactive materials to the systems to be more affordable for bone construction. We are uh, making uh, nanostructure implantable materials nanostructures, now to the base of nanotechnology, uh, because uh, the interface uh, it can be uh, uh, planned and uh, they are more active if we are going uh, uh, to the nano level. Uh, of course, we are concentrating to surface modifications also, and we are providing coatings to these implants. And also, we, we have feedbacks from medical data from diagnosis. So in all research, we uh, are concentrating to natural materials. So we are making coatings by using uh, eggshells. So chicken happens uh, to be uh, uh, in uh, every lecture here now. But uh, in our case, the product, and I'm not going to philosophy what was the first the chicken or the egg, but we, we, just, uh, we just used the egg because there is a widespread in Hungary and, uh, and uh, it's, it's a waste material but it's full with, uh, with a lot of uh, calcium uh, and also trace elements like strontium, magnesium and, uh, and zinc and uh, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite good material to start the research to coat the implants. So we want to coat with this nanostructure material, what we uh, obtained from the uh, seashell, or can be also a seashell or, or action also, uh, you can see the nanostructural uh, materials what uh, are realized here, and uh, we uh, tried uh, with the help of uh, cooperation with our colleagues from uh, South Korea in the Halim University or Kanmukwonju National University in animal models or clinical models. And uh, you can see here the, there are some white rabbits were sacrificed for these uh, uh, experiments. And so this is the arm field control and this is the field with the nanohydroxyapatite produced uh, in Hungary uh, uh, from eggshell. And it was proved that it's very efficient and um, Actually, is feeling after 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 four weeks is beginning, and after eight weeks uh, is is feeling all these uh, holes, eight millimeter holes, what the uh, doctors uh, uh, report here. And also in, in Korea, it was very fast uh, experiment, so uh, they had a patient, and also the jawbone is what intersected. Some teeth also implants uh, were installed. But uh, actually, it was built uh, this graft bone, uh, jaw bone, by hydroxyapatite, uh, hydroxyapatite, and it was uh, uh, the, the, the healing. It was very fast after uh, four weeks. It was happening, and the patient patient uh, could leave uh, happily uh, uh, from hospital. And uh, it is uh, it is uh, always good to leave hospital uh, after, uh, so not to stay too long in hospital. In our research, we also concentrated to bone structures. So we have a cortical dense bone and then the trabecular uh, porous bone. Uh, we can provide and uh, we can uh, do this uh, structure by using silicon nitride. Actually, we have a, a laboratory that uh, is working for silicon nitride for more than uh, 30 years. But we were concentrating to other applications at this, at this time. And uh, we know that in, uh, <coughs> after alumina, uh, zirconia that uh, dentists really ha happily use, and uh, zirconia toughened alumina, alumina toughened zirconia are widespread used, but nowadays silicon nitride is becoming more and more in fashion. I, uh, as, a, as, a, as a spy, uh, spin off uh, device, uh, you can see a Syntex American company is producing. We fought in a European project, uh, Graphene flagship or Flag Era, uh, to make uh, from silicon nitride the same bone structure. So we have a dense uh, structure, dense, a multi-layer structure, so we have a dense. We incorporated graphene uh, 
uh, uh, in the middle part, and, and we make a foam like structure, a porous structure. Uh, actually, it is, it, it, it is like the trabecular uh, 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 bone, so porous bone, actually. And uh, we also could increase by incorporation of graphite not only the porosity, but uh, we provided uh, electrical conductivity to the structures. Uh, we know also the bone cells can be, um, can be made more easily to, to, to spread by applying uh, electrical current. So we can initiate the spreading of the bone cells. In our case, the bone cells uh, should be uh, uh, used uh, or sh should be attached uh, uh, very strongly uh, to the surfaces. And we, we should produce new bones, actually, by using hydroxyapatite, what we are using. And uh, actually, uh, we want to replace actually the medical uh, implants like uh, hip joints made from um, um, titanium, aluminum, vanadium alloys. We are aiming to replace the, uh, the harmful uh, uh, joints that are providing to the uh, some uh, contamination of uh, vanadium or aluminum in your body that are harmful. So if we can change to be silicon nitride, so actually this is a new concept, so silicon nitride, we can provide the multi-layer structure, granular structure, uh, uh, having uh, at the surface silicon nitride graphene layer, and also we can apply uh, nanohydroxyapatite. Uh, of course, in our dis discussions with, uh, with the groups uh, and scientists in uh, IMEC, Catholic University Leuven, uh, we also discussed about to uh, apply some uh, uh, implantable sensors. In the case of in vitro, we have a new bone formation, we observe new bone formations, so hydroxyapatite transforming to new bones, and these new bones and the new bone cells, by to the new bone cells, are changing the environment here and uh, we are expecting from this sensor some, some signals that, uh, that, okay, the healing is uh, going on. So we have a good way to transform and to uh, make the integration of implant. And hopefully that is without uh, uh, inflammation. So, and uh, hopefully these new materials uh, can provide a better solution than uh, materials used until today. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is uh, Peter Patrick. I'm also uh, very grateful that I can talk uh, here today. I'm sure um, everybody is uh, tired enough already, so I need to be quick. Uh, uh, within this uh, topic that I, that I uh, gave, I'd like to focus uh, here on the, on the measurement, optical measurement of the thin films. Um, this is a short summary uh, of, uh, of, of different methods to characterize thin films. Uh, here, uh, there are three groups here. The DP means that uh, it's depth profiling. It means that we remove uh, parts of the layer, either by, by, by sputtering uh, with ions and thinning the layer, and we, we measure either the, the particles that are uh, removed or the remaining uh, surface of the layer. Uh, the typical features uh, are shown here that the lateral resolution is, is, is not uh, usually not very good. The resolution is usually good in a nanometer range and the duration is quite long. The, the second part it measures the whole layer and in one, one one time, so it not, uh, it's not it's non destructive, not removing the layer. And the third group is the cross-sectional methods in which we make a small uh, piece of the layer within the layer. This is typically uh, electron microscopy and related methods. But uh, uh, usually, uh, most of the methods are are are, uh, are uh, um, uh, very slow. So. Uh, uh, now in this talk I focus on ellipsometry because it provides a way of uh, non-destructive measurement and a quick measurement. Um, 
maybe most of you uh, were uh, polarizing sunglass, uh, so it, it works very well because most of the layers, when the light is reflected, it gets polarized. For example, if you are at, um, at the lake and the sun is reflected from the uh, water surface, uh, sunglass which uh, filters out polarization is very good in this case, or if you drive in the night, then the headlight, the lamp of the cars uh, uses this uh, mirror, uh, back mirror, to, to provide the, the light, and it is also polarized, so uh, polarizing sunglass uh, filters it. So in ellipsometry, we measure the change of this polarization when the light is reflected, and mathematically it can be, can be uh, described by two components, one component, so that light is, uh, is the oscillation of the electric field, and uh, uh, maybe you remember the Fresnel reflection equations, which, uh, which is different for, for the light uh, where the electric field is parallel uh, uh, of the plane of incidence and perpendicular. So in, in a general case, if you have a, a linearly polarized light, which means that the electric field is, uh, is oriented in one direction, usually at, after the reflection it will be elliptically polarized. So this is why the method is called ellipsometry. And the, the most important feature is if you measure this elliptical polarization, you measure it by rotating the polarizer and you select one direction and, uh, and if you rotate the polarizer you have a, a sinus a square like uh, intensity and the detector and from this uh, the shape of this intensity you can determine, uh, sorry, you can determine uh, this uh, elliptical polarization and it includes the phase shift between the two components and that this is why the method is very sensitive. You can measure much smaller uh, thicknesses than the, than the wavelengths of the light. So if you typically use a visible light like a 500 nanometer, then the precision can be below even one nanometer and uh, you don't have to use a coherent light source. You, have, you can use a, a, a regular lamp and a regular detector, so the, the instrument is, is very, very simple. And uh, I just so, show here typical spectra what we measure. So these are the two, these are the two parts we measure. The measure refraction coefficient, this is the uh, polarized perpendicular, par parallel to the plane of incidence, perpendicular, and uh, one, one measured uh, um, uh, value is the ratio, absolute value of the ratio of these two, and uh, even most important is this, this green one. This is the phase shift between the two. And we can measure as a function of uh, wavelengths or as a function of uh, angle of incidence. So we have a lot of data, but it's indirect. So the spectrum itself doesn't give you any clue what, what it is. So we need a model. This measurement was made on a silicon wafer. This is single crystal silicon. You have a oxide layer. And this is uh, 56 nanometer. And, uh, you see that we have one model parameter, this is the thickness, of okay, two, because the angle of incidence is a little bit adjusted, but it's not very necessary. And the black lines are the fit to the measured data, which are the, which are the colored, like, uh, colored lines. So you see that we did, with one parameter, if we have a very good description in a very broad wavelength range. But what if we change the thickness? So you, you can see here, this is 56 nanometer and we change it to 57 nanometers, so we increased one nanometer. And uh, we, we focus on the delta, the phase shift, and the black line here is uh, the, measure, the simulation for 57 nanometer, and, uh, and this purple is 56. So we change one nanometer in thickness, and the delta value we measure changed maybe 10, it's, it's approximately 10 degrees. And already from the, from the roughness, from the scattering of this light line, you can see that the, the uh, accuracy of the measurement of this, this value here is 0.05. So the change here is uh, approximately three orders of magnitude uh, larger than, than the accuracy of the measurement. So this gives you a feeling of, of the sensitivity because we only changed here one nanometer. So we have a non-destructive method, which is very quick. Such a spectrum can be measured in one second. So what can we use for this method? And I only have three more slides to show you some examples. Uh, one example is that uh, uh, so this is an ellipsometer. This is a light source. This is a detector here. And 
we usually put a sample here, measure the refraction of light. But we can guide the light into a cell. This is a flow cell. At, at the top, this is a cylindrical glass. And we can focus the light into this cell, which is very small. You can see here, this is 8 millimeter by 4 millimeter by 1 millimeter. So it's a, a few micrometer cell. And uh, in this cell, we can measure how, for example, protein molecules uh, adsorb at the surface. And we can measure it during the adsorption. It, it means that in one, sec one second resolution, we have this uh, large amount of data, and we can uh, create models, and we can fit the thickness, the refractive index, the volume fraction of proteins at the surface. So even just uh, when several molecules start to accumulate at the surface, you can already, uh, already be very sensitively measure and, uh, and non-destructively. So this is one example what uh, we can use it for. The second example is also a non-destructive in-situ measurement. This is a heat, uh, heat stage. This is a ceramic plate. Uh, you can heat it up to 600 degrees C and put the sample on top. And uh, you can focus the light with, within, inside this glass tube. And you can even, so the spot size is below one millimeter, and you can even move the, the spot along the axis of this tube. And this also has uh, one second uh, time resolution. You can see here part of the spectrum. Uh, it's, it's even larger. It's, uh, it's uh, from 100, uh, 190 nanometer to 1,700. So it, it is 1,400 uh, measure data here in e each second, basically. And if you evaluate uh, of this spectra like this, this, these are one point in this graph, this time-dependent measurement. So each point here is uh, 1,400 uh, data and uh, fitted. And from this fit, uh, you can determine the, the thickness. And you can follow the change of the thickness as a function of time. But you not only have the thickness, because we, you can use a complex model with many parameters. And you can also <coughs> have the refractive index, the volume fraction, the, uh, uh, inhomogeneity, roughness, a lot of information each, uh, in each second. So this is also an opportunity that you can heat up uh, a sample and you can in situ, you have an insight with a below nanometer uh, uh, thickness resolution, a one second time resolution, and uh, the refractive index resolution is uh, 10 to the minus 4, so, so, so you can uh, see a lot very quickly, non-destructively, and you can follow processes uh, very well. And the last example is uh, uh, the mapping of large surfaces. So it's, uh, it can be adjusted. So we have a point like light source. You illuminate a large surface. You can even you can illuminate even a one meter size surface. You can have maybe 10, maybe 1,000 measure points. And each point can be measured simultaneously because the, ref the reflected light comes to a CCD detector. So each point of the detector corresponds to one point of the surface on the sample. And in each point of the detector, you have this uh, sine square uh, change of the signal. So the shade, the, the, uh, the polarization the state of the light can be determined for each pixel of the detector simultaneously. So we have 1,000 point uh, very quickly and uh, you can measure a large surface uh, also in, within a very short time. Otherwise, if you just uh, move a spot uh, along the surface and measure, uh, even if it's just a uh, couple of uh, uh, seconds or minutes, it is a very long time to map a surface. But uh, because we can measure simultaneously each point, uh, we can measure large surfaces very quickly. And again, it also for these large surfaces, it has a nanometer accuracy for the thickness, which is very, very important. So there are no other method that can map uh, such a large surface in so many points so quickly, non-destructive and so sensitively. So, and it can be adjusted for uh, uh, a lot of uh, sizes. It can be used even in a, in a vacuum chamber and so on. So, for even if uh, it, it, it maybe it could be also used for measuring uh, the paint, thickness of the paint on a car surface or, 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 or any other surfaces. So these were the three uh, examples.
see examples. Mm -hmm. So the liquid cell, heat cell, and the large surface mapping optically. So thank you for your attention.